uh, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Isaiah uh, 64. Well, I'm going to tell you something. The Lord laid this on my heart during the course of the revival, and I didn't understand why. Uh, so I got to look, and, and I preached from these scriptures about a year or so back. So I don't want y'all to think that I'm already repeating sermons that I started with when I came here. That's not the case. This is different, different train of thought, different ideas. But I knew that God laid this on my heart. Over and over during the course of the revival, the thought came to me that comes out of verse number one. And, um, and I, uh, <laughs> I, I thought, well, Lord, I think I've, I've preached from this before. But it just didn't go away. And so I got to looking at it, and sure enough, I had uh, in the past, uh, a year or so back. Uh, but here we are again this morning. So I want to I encourage you on the idea of when God comes down. Now, I need your prayers this morning because my voice, as you can tell, is still real weak. Uh, the prophet said, Oh, that thou wouldest rend the heavens, that thou wouldest come down, that the mountains might flow down at thy presence. As when the melting fire burns, the fire causes the way waters to boil to make thy name known to your adversaries, that the nations may tremble at thy presence. When thou didst terrible things which we look not for, Thou camest down, the mountains flowed down at thy presence. For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard nor perceived by the ear, neither hath the eye seen, O God, beside thee what he hath prepared for him that waits for him. Thou meetest him with re that rejoiceth and works righteousness, those that remember you in your ways, behold, you are wroth, angry, wrath. For we have sinned. Did you get that? In those is continuance and shall, and we shall be saved. Did you get that? But we as are all as unclean thing, an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we do all fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. There is none that calls upon thy name, that stirs up himself to take hold of thee. Thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us, because of our iniquities. Please hear that word. But Lord, now, O Lord, thou art our Father. We are the clay. You're the potter. We are the work of your hands. Be not angry, very sore. O Lord, neither remember iniquity forever. Behold, see, we beseech thee, we are all thy people. Thy holy cities are a wilderness. Zion, a wilderness. Jerusalem, a desolation. In our holy and our beautiful house, where our fathers praise thee, is burned up with fire. And all our pleasant things are laid waste. Will you refrain yourself for these things, O Lord? Wilt thou hold thy peace and afflict us very sore? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you that you can read that scripture, and we should read that scripture multiple times. And the more that we read it, and the more that we grasp what God is saying, I understand that the prophet is speaking about Israel and their 
past. He's also describing Israel and their future. But he's also dealing with those who call on his name. And when I sat during the course of the revival this week, I, uh, I felt, strongly felt, multiple times felt that God brought these scriptures to my mind. And again, knowing that I had preached from here before, I said, God, I, I don't understand. When I, when I preach a text, I try uh, to look at it, try to gain as much understanding from it as I can. And then whenever I realize that I've just skimmed the surface, it's a very humbling thing. And that's the way the Word of God does us. No matter if you read something last week or last month and God ministered to you from that, Whenever you open the Word of God and you begin to read it again, God's going to talk to you again from it. And it because it's a living Word. And it speaks to us where we are right now today. I said this the other day. I want to repeat it this morning. I, every day during the course of the revival, either got a phone call, Sister Pat got a phone call, or got a text, and Sister Pat got a text, one of the two. We constantly heard on a daily basis, and I, I'm not kidding you, every day, people were calling and texting us, letting us know what God had done for them as a result of the revival. Some of them were not able to attend. I had a lady call, corner me this morning when I came out the parsonage. She said, I want to tell you, and she had already called, but she said, I just want to tell you how God had blessed me. How God revealed some things to me. And she said, I wasn't here, but I was watching it at home. And she made this statement and she said, Pastor, I was, I was reasoning. I was justifying. Are y'all with me? Where I'm at. I was justifying what I was doing. But the Holy Spirit helped me to understand that no matter what my reasons were, what I thought, he said, you're holding unforgiveness in your heart and you cannot do that. I watched as night after night God came and ministered to people where they were. And ladies and gentlemen, that's revival. And your pastor's corner in the bulletin this morning, I kind of summed it up as best I knew how, and yet I failed so miserably to do that. But I can tell you we had people in this place that were laughing and rejoicing in the Holy Ghost. Sister Judy over there, I'm talking about this Sister Judy over here, the one that's got her head down, don't want to see that I'm talking to her. <laughs> Left one night, and I thought she needed a driver. Because God's touch on her life and on her physical being. I rejoice with that, ladies and gentlemen. I thank God for that. And um, I just want to talk to you just a little bit. Now, if you look at these scriptures, the prophets crying out said that God would literally rip apart the heavens in view of the things that's revealed in chapter number 63. Verse number 11 of our text talks about how the temple has been burned, that the city is desolate, that the land lies waste, and that God's people have been carried away captive to a distant land. And he said, God, come, and please come quickly. And I've asked myself as a pastor so many times about our nation and even about the church world today, what is it going to take? What is it going to take for us to seek God? Amen. I said to you at the start of this, I said, now I don't want this to be uh, something that's revival. I'm talking about to be something that we just did. And somebody said this morning, said, man, I'm ready to have another revival. And uh, I, I said, well, you know, we had that revival spirit before we, came, before we started a revival. And the, the key is to maintain that. 
Now, we want to talk about how do we, how do, we do that. Uh, and I get my mind, in my, in my mind, I, I see the prophet in lieu and in sight of everything that's going on around him. He's crying out to God. And I can hear the anguish of his heart. God, if you just rip apart the heavens and come down and make all of this stuff right. He's speaking about a revival, if you will. Lord, help my voice. Now, there are other uh, versions. The Septuagint renders that scripture that if you would open the heavens. Y'all hearing that? If you would open the heavens. How many of you remember what Brother Doug shared with us? months ago about an open windows of heaven and God looking down and pouring blessings out upon us. Y'all remember that? I believe it's still going on, don't y'all? I believe it is. And so this, this scripture is coming to pass in our, in our life and in our church. And so the Syriac, uh, Syriac, Syriac version renders it, Oh, that thou wouldest open the heavens using a word that is usually applied to the opening of a door. Many times in the Scripture, the Lord is seen as the door. He's seen as standing at the door, knocking in Revelations, I believe, at the church of Laodicea, and warning in. Uh, he's seen, he said, I am the door. Didn't he say that? And so over and over again we see this, so this is not uncommon to identifying where the Lord is at. I've had people come through those doors back there and say, I'll tell you, I sense the presence of God when I come in the building. And that's one of the things that brother and sister um, Rutland said from down in Texas when they come here several months ago and visited with us, and then they came back for the revival this past week. They said, Pastor, you've got something here you just don't find every day. You know what I'm afraid of, ladies and gentlemen, from me all the way down to y'all, from the board to the, every staff member to every lay person that's here? This is what I fear. I love living in this area. I love it. Uh, years ago, when we first come back from Louisiana, we lived up in northwest Arkansas for a couple of years, and I'd taken a church that was in much trouble. And I was appointed there for two years, and I had ministered there for two years. But one of the things I loved about it was the beautiful views. The church set up over the city lake where the lake fed the water system for the city, and it set up over that lake, all right? You couldn't see it for the trees, but it was down there. And then on up on the side of the mountain behind the church, they had built a parsonage up there, and that's where we live. So you can literally look out and sit out on the front porch of the parsonage and see the top of the church building. That's how high you were. And we used to have deer and turkey run through between the church and the parsonage along a, a ditch, a ravine that was there, that was on the property, that was a natural ravine. And I, and I remember sitting out there so many times, my wife and I, and talking about and enjoying. It was always a breeze. And, and we enjoyed that breeze. And we enjoyed the views. And a friend of mine who pastors there, that's his hometown, he, uh, he and I were going together to Fort Smith one day. And we were coming back. He was driving. I was sitting over there. And I was just looking around. And I always done that at the beauty, at, at, the, at, at, at God's handiwork. And I, I said to him, I said, Brother, you, uh, isn't this beautiful? Isn't this absolutely gorgeous? And my favorite time of the year is fall, and that might have been the time that it was. And I don't remember that, but he looked around and he said, yeah, it is nice. It is, it is nice. And I said, nice? I said, man, this is gorgeous. This is beautiful. And, uh, and he said, well, Brother Pack, he said, I was raised up here. And he said, I, you know, I'm used to seeing it. It, it, doesn't, it don't bother me. It don't move me anymore. And I remember when he said that, I said, my God, that is tragic. 
when we lived in South Louisiana, now there's a different kind of beauty down there because if you don't like swamps and cypress trees and moss hanging out of the trees, you're not going to like it down there. But to me, it is absolutely gorgeous in its own right. From one extreme of the earth or, or the nation to the other extreme of the nation, God has blessed us with beauty that is matchless. You don't have to go out of the nation uh, to have a great, great time of, of vacation. You can go anywhere. Sister Pack and I have been up in the Seattle area. We've been over to Colorado to the mountain areas. We've been to the Smokies, and I know we've been up into Kentucky and all over the Ozarks. And man, it just it amazes me. But you see, my friend, he never even notices the beauty because he's so used to it. You see what I'm saying? And I said, God, that is a description of the church. Now, the folks that come in here, they recognize it. When I was in South Louisiana, uh, Sister Pack and I pray that God would anoint us every... I, I prayed this morning and been praying all week that God would, would anoint us for what He's called us to do and, and reveal that to us as we walk in faith. And I, and I remember as God was ministering to the knees around the, around the church, I said... God, I, I want you, I want you to just stay. I, I want you to come, and I want you to stay. And when Peter, James, and John up on the side of the mountain saw the glory of God through Christ, they had the same response. They said, Lord, let us build three houses, and we'll just, we'll just stay here. And we'll just, we'll just stay. And, and Jesus said, no, 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 you can't stay. But listen, folks, he's not, he's not saying by that that you cannot enjoy his presence on a regular basis. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that while you come in here and you enjoy the presence and the glory of God, when you leave this mountaintop experiences down in the valley, there's a demon-possessed person. As Bruce said the other day, he said there is, are you, are you hearing me? There is a legion out there that we need to go get. And so somehow or another, the church seems to be either all out doing that or they seem to be all reclusive, building our houses and staying on the inside and enjoying the blessings of the Lord. And there's got to be a, there's gotta be a medium between the two of that, ladies and gentlemen. We'd be a sad people if we come in here and experience the presence of God the way that we do and didn't have the desire to share that with our lost family and our lost friends and our lost neighbors. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> Brother Mike is not here, so I'm going to pick on him. Sister, Sister Jeanette will tell him. <clears throat> I, uh, uh, my voice gives me a lot of problems, especially this time of the year because my voice is not as soft as Mike's is. And I love the way that that operates for him. He just, he just speaks. He just talks, just normal. See, in the old days, they used to call preaching talks. Y'all know that? Mike fits that bill to a T, and whenever he gets done, the Holy Ghost moves and confirms his word with signs following. I wish I was more like that. But I'm one of those guys that just gets so excited I can't hardly contain myself. And I'm having to do that this morning, and I'm having a hard time, if y'all would know that. So if you love me, pray for me. Somebody say amen right there. God loves to come down among his people. The Bible reflects this. Would y'all say that? If you look back in the history of the Word of God, God stepped down into the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve had sinned and provided a covering for them. He stepped down with Moses on the top of the mountain and wrote with his own finger the Ten Commandments. He stepped down in the Old Testament where they were going to build this tab tower we know it as a Tower of Babel because God stepped down. He said these were, let us go down and confound their language. Are you, are you understand what I'm saying? 
So he loves to step down. He stepped down when he was born in a manger as a baby. He stepped down at the Crowley's cross and he saved us. He stepped down, ladies and gentlemen, on the day of Pentecost and gave the church the baptism of power and the Holy Spirit. In the future, he's going to come back and he's going to step down with the return of Christ. And what God wants us to understand is I love being with my people. Now, if you're one here this morning and you can't figure out why it is that you like to go to church, that's why. Because God has put enough of himself inside of you that he wants you to know that's what he wants to do. Thank you, Sister Pack. Uh, ain't that pretty? <clears throat> oh, it's just water. <clears throat> she tells me all the time, she says, you don't want to drink after me. I said, why? She said, because I backwashed. And I was looking... I'll give her a little gift before I leave it. Amen. Now listen, let me get let me get to this thing here this morning because I, even though this is different, I believe that this is important for us because what God has done in our midst, I believe God, I told y'all, did, didn't I tell y'all that for months before the revival ever started, I felt like that the revival was going to set a precedence for our church's future. Did I tell y'all that? I did say that publicly, didn't I? I know I said it to several folks in the church. I thought I said it publicly. I could not, under, I could not explain that. I could not understand that. I, and, and, I, and, and I'm not sure that I'm understanding it right now. All I know is I don't want what we've experienced this year to just dry up and blow away. And we remember it as a revival of 2022. I don't want that. I want, I, want it to be a, I want it to be something that we determine in our hearts and in our minds that we want to carry and that we want to go forth with. It does not come. I said this in the course of the revival. Revival don't happen because we get an evangelist in. Revival is a God-given thing, ladies and gentlemen. That's the reason we had the spirit of revival before we actually had revival is because God was in the house. You understand that? And and so I, I want I want you to I want you to get this and I and I've noticed I've noticed uh, over the time that I've been here that we got people just give an example of, of of where we are as a church we've got people that that don't want to receive communion every time we receive, receive communion they exit stage left and what that tells me is they don't feel worthy to do that they don't feel worthy to partake and I don't ever judge anybody I'm not trying to judge them now. But my heart says this. My heart says whatever it is that's going on in their life that prevents them from being able to enjoy the remembering of the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection through the giving of his body and his blood on Calvary, I believe the Holy Ghost wants to cure that, heal that, rectify that, or whatever's going on in their life. That's what I believe. Because if, you, if we, none, of, none of us would be able to receive communion if we had to be worthy of it. None of us are worthy of it. None of us. None of us. From the deacon board to the pastor to the, uh, to the staff. None of us. Not the Pope. The Pope's not worthy of it. If, you, if you're one that thinks he's the holiest man on the planet, then I'm just here to tell you he's not as holy as what you think he is. He's a human being. And there is not a human being on this planet that is worthy of receiving communion as we celebrate and commemorate the body and the blood of Christ. But we're made worthy. Amen. Did you get that? We're made worthy. All right? And so when we do that, we're remembering why we're made worthy. All right? And so I want everybody to get a right understanding on that so that they so that they can begin to uh, celebrate. Celebrate Jesus. Celebrate what he's done. Celebrate who he is, not who he was, who he is. Celebrate what he is now, what he's going to do in the future, and what he has done now. Are you with me? Just celebrate him. 
Now, we're, we're entering into the holiday seasons. I'm going to tell you, Thanksgiving is my favorite holiday. Uh, because it is not perverted. Okay? Uh, and I don't want to get on your toes this morning. I, I'm not trying to be ugly. I'm just talking about entertaining the presence of the Lord. Uh, Thanksgiving, we just gather together and we, have, we give thanks. And a lot of times we're giving thanks for our family. We're giving thanks for our church, our, our, our jobs, our whatever. And, and we need to give God thanks all the time. But I love, I love, now our family's going to gather down at the river down there. My wife went talking about, we're going we're gonna to cook this, this, and this. And we're going to cook on the grill. And somebody said, I want some dressing. I said, I'm in that bunch. Amen. I mean, how do you give thanks without chicken and dressing? I, you know. Ah, I'm kid. You know what I'm talking about. But the thing is, a lot of times what we do and we say that we're remembering Christ is, uh, you know, or what he's done for us, it's really made it about ourselves, And that's, that's not pleasing to God. Uh, now, please hold on. I want, I want you to realize there's three things that I want to share with you this morning. First of all, in order for us to have the Holy Spirit and to have God to step down and to come down in our midst and to visit our lives and our ministries, we, gotta, we, we have to realize uh, the presence that produces revival. Again, it's not the evangelist, it's not the pastor, it's not, it's not any of us as a human being. Isaiah chapter 64, verses 1 through 5, part of our text, tells us that the mountains will melt, verses 1 and 2, sinners will tremble and shake, if you will, in verses 3 and 4. And then he said, the righteous will rejoice, somebody say amen, verses 4 and 5. When God comes down, that's what happens. Now, we live in a generation today, now, now please hear me, and I'm not trying to be critical, but we live in a generation today where churches and pastors and deacon boards and all of them, they want to build a church that is what has come to be known as seeker-friendly. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't want to have anything to do with a church like that. Because I would have never known Christ had they been more concerned about making me feel welcome and feel at home and feel comfortable. You say, Pastor, don't we want people to... Yes, we do. But not at the, experience, at the expense of the Holy Spirit being able to deal with the sin that's in their life. You understand what I'm saying? Things happen when God shows up at the house. All right? Ver verses 1 through 5 shows us that. I just read it to you. Mountains melt down. Somebody said, what are you talking about mountains? He's not talking about physical mountains. However, that is a part of what's going to take place. You know, when he comes back, the Scripture said he's going to put his feet upon the Mount of Olives, and they're going to cleave half one way and half the other. That's, that's a heck of an earthquake. Would you say amen to that? But ladies and gentlemen, if you think about it, in our society today, what are some of the mountains, if you will, that need to be melted in the presence of the Lord? What about the mountains of pride? What about bigotry and hatefulness, that root of bitterness that comes in, that unforgiveness, those mountains that we build up in our lives. And he said, whenever I come down, he said, that stuff's going to melt away. We saw it this week, ladies and gentlemen. He said, well, how? I mean, we wouldn't, it wasn't nothing like Brownsville. It, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't like Brownsville. It was like God wanted it to be. It was not even like I thought it was going to be. It wasn't even like I wanted it to be. It wasn't even like I prayed that it would be. Are y'all are y'all hearing what I'm saying? I mean, I want to see some of us old folks walk in the back of the pews. And Brother Robert Smith leading the way. Oh, hallelujah. No, not really. But I wanted to, I wanted to see, I wanted to see. And you know, one night we, we, some of our ladies were praying for this lady. And, and uh, she was delivered, absolutely delivered of, of something that was hindering her physically. The next night her sister came. And they were, they were gathering to pray and anoint her the same way they had her sister. 
And that's because that's what they wanted. And, I, and I, they couldn't get the oil to come out of the bottle. Am, am I telling y'all, I, I don't know who the ladies were. They couldn't get the oil to come out of the bottle. Half a bottle of oil, it wouldn't come out. I'm sitting over here, and I'm talking to Brother Koo's son. I got the oil in my hand. We've been praying for folks, and I'm just sitting down. And, and they said, uh, we, need, we need that oil. I said, well, here. I just hadn't made it back. Over here, here, take it, take it. They come over here, and they come back in a few minutes and said, we can't get no oil out of there. I said, well, let me see. And I, I got up and come over here, took the oil, and I shook it. Nothing. Y'all hearing what? Well, I've done that before, hadn't I, brother? But son, didn't I, hadn't I done that before? I don't remember what it's about, but I've done that before. But anyhow, I'm standing there, and we're praying for those, this lady, and I can, I'm standing, I'm listening, and the ladies are praying, and, and I just, I'm, I, all the time I got that bottle turned upside down, and it's a perfume bottle. I don't know where it came from or who brought it or whatever. Most, a lot of times when you pull the top out of it, that little old plug comes out, and you got a hole about half the size of a dime. You got all the oil you want. That day, I tried to pry it out. That night, I couldn't get it to pry out. I said, now, God, what in the round world is going on here? I don't understand this. We want to pray uh, for this lady, and we want to anoint her with oil. And I'm standing there and turning the bottle upside down, and I'm just kind of shaking it, and I'm rubbing it, and I'm rubbing my finger across the top. And I got to looking, and I had oil all over my hands. And I stepped up in the crowd, and I said, sis, we're going to anoint you with oil, and we're going to believe God is going to touch you. And when I touched her with my fingers, it were oil. It's not, Brother Pack, please understand. It's not even the oil. Some of you think it's the oil. It's not the oil. It's the presence. Okay? And when I touched her, immediately her body began to tremble. And I thought, oh, God, he's fixing to do something here. And so I began to listen to her praying. And as she prayed, she began to talk about, help me to forgive him. Help me to forgive him. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait, wait, wait a minute there. Now I'm understanding why the oil wouldn't come out. Some pastor, what are you talking about? I'm telling you how God directs the service whenever God is allowed to be God in our midst. Nothing wrong with what the ladies were doing. Please don't misunderstand that. I'm grateful for every person in this building that gathers and prays with people that have a need. I'm not one of those pastors that feels like I got to do it all. Trust me, I'm not. But I'm standing there, and when I, when I hear this, I step up into the midst, and I say, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. Uh, and I got her attention. I said, look at me. A and I said, am I understanding that you're here, and you want to be delivered from unforgiveness for somebody that's hurt you and wronged you? And she said, yes, sir. And I backed up. I said, we're going about this all the wrong way. I told her, I said, since you can get it in every prayer line from here to Kentucky and back, and I don't know why, I said Kentucky. I said Kentucky and back, and it ain't going to deliver you. And she looked real surprised. I said, let me tell you, the Word of God is going to deliver you when you do what the Word of God said do. Amen. And in that, in that context, I began to share with her scriptures that I preached from here a while back. And in that, she began to pray, and she began to give it to God. As Brother Mike said Monday night, she offered that on the altar. I said, honey, you ain't got it. You don't have what it takes to forgive somebody. Now, if you're somebody in this building today, and you say, Pastor, I've got problems with that. I, 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 I say I forgive, but bless God, I don't forget. Or I've got, I've got folks that come to me and said, you know, I've had people that was wounded 20 years ago come to me, and, and they can tell me in detail what was done. Well, Pastor, what does that tell you? That tells me they think they've done something they haven't done, which is forgive. I don't know why I'm saying this, folks. This is not a part of my notes. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to get to preach this this morning. I'm just, talk, I'm just talking to you from my heart. And I, and, I, and I said to her, I said, listen, uh, when Jesus, when Peter asked Jesus, said, I want, to, I want to ask you, how many times a day do I forgive my brother that offends me? Seven times in a day? And Peter said, no, 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 70 times seven in a day. Ain't that what he says? 70 times seven? I believe I'm right on that. And, and, and the Lord, it's, it's, uh, what's, what's that, 490 or 306? What is that? 490 times a day. Can I tell you my worst enemy can't offend me 490 times a day? Now, now the, the reason he said that to Peter is he said, Peter, what I want you to, and Peter no doubt was 
flabbergasted by that. I know that wasn't the word then, but it is now. And Peter looked at him and said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. He was saying, Peter, I'm trying to tell you you can't do that. You don't have the ability to do that. And I said to those of us that are standing by, I said, we that are in the altars, working the altars, we need to know why we're praying for people when we pray. There's a difference between deliverance and obedience to the Word of God. And whenever this lady realized that what I was saying to her was true, she offered it to God and said, Lord, I can't do this. Please help me. Amen. Do this through me, Lord. And I'm telling you, I, don't, I, I believe honestly with all my heart. I, and listen, I've been there. I'm not telling you something I hadn't, done, I hadn't experienced myself. <clears throat> but I, I, she, I asked her, I said, are you, a believe, are you a Christian? Her sister spoke up, who's been coming to our church. And she said, oh, yeah, she's a Christian. God uses her in the gifts. Please pardon me. That's a big bottle, and that's a long way down. And I asked her, I said, do you want, do you want to continue to be using the gifts of the Spirit? Well, yeah. I said, I'm going to give you a piece of advice. I said, God says if you're going to bear the vessels of the Lord, you're going to do and you're going to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, then you need to be doing your best to be following the Lord, and you've got to be obedient to God. You've got to be a holy person. So let me tell you what you need to do is you need to forget about the gifts right now and concentrate on doing what God has asked you to do. And when you get this done, God's going to, the gifts will take care of themselves. Do you all understand what I'm saying? The gifts will take care of themselves, but the most important thing is that you be well, that you be healed, huh? Or that that you know you just uh, that you just walk in wholeness. That's that, and that's the important thing for us, ladies and gentlemen. We can't give away what we don't have. You understand what I'm saying? If I've got bitterness in my heart and unforgiveness in my heart and I stand in this pulpit week after week after week and I preach that, I don't preach that, but I'm just preaching and ministering to you, there's a spirit behind that. And the old timer said, listen, the, the church will take on the spirit and the nature of the pastor. Some of you have been living for God long enough to know this. And so what I've got to, as your pastor, as your shepherd, what I've got to do is I've got to get myself to the place that I'm giving you something that I want you to give to somebody else. You understand what I'm saying? I don't want you in a conversation with me to constantly hear me in a negative way. I don't want you to hear bitterness in me. I don't want my wife and my marriage to fall apart in front of you and try to tell you how to be married and how to live a happy life. I don't want none of that. I want us to enjoy being in one another's presence. I want us to worship God in spirit and in truth. And I want us to yield to the direction and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit every time that we come into the house of God. You see, that's the reason that we have the spirit of revival before revival got here. And that's the reason, ladies and gentlemen, that we have revival spirit still here after they've left because what we were doing before we can continue to do and God will continue to show up. Amen. Now I'm going to tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, that I, I, as your pastor, can I pastor just a minute? Somebody, somebody call me pastor this morning. Good morning, Pastor. I'm not going to. I'm not going to reveal her. She sat back on that back pew, though. I'll tell you that. I knew she was teasing me. She said, "We are so blessed to have you and Sister Pack." And I, I said, "Well, Sister Pack, and I feel blessed to be here." So that's that's a mutual thing. But what I'm saying to you this morning is as your pastor what I've noticed is that we have a tendency to start drawing back when the Holy Spirit begins to move in the altar now I'm going to tell you a couple of things first of all that's normal and that's natural the scripture said in our text this morning he said what sinners shake righteous will rejoice men 
mountains will melt because what happens is whatever it is on the inside of us that God's dealing with, it begins to break loose because God's about to melt it out of your life, and that's a fearful thing. And some of us have this mindset, well, Pastor, I've got the right to feel this way. You don't know. And just like her sister told me this morning, I was so blessed. She said, God was showing me, you're just making excuses. And I've actually been one of those guys that said, you don't know where I've been, and you don't know what I've been through. And Sister Mary, I got myself to the point in the place that I actually had the mindset that no other preacher in the world had ever been where I'd been and been through what I'd been through. But the reality of it is, I'm not. I'm just a human. I'm just a man, like any other pastor or any other minister is. And so when I began to make excuses for me feeling the way that I did, you see, when I left my first church, I had a bad experience. I don't even put it on the resume no more because I wasn't there but 11 months. I left running from the devil. I didn't know what to do. Other than kill some people and ask God to forgive me, I didn't know what to do. I knew that wouldn't work. So I left. And I cried as I left. I, I, I cried because I'd yielded. I, I didn't yield myself to God the way that I, I didn't know how. Brother Kenny, I didn't know how. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's a good word. I did not know how. And so I, I went to what I call my first church. And I was there, and I even told my wife, I said, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to love these folks. I'm going to preach to them. And I'm going to bury their dead, and I'll marry their young. But other than that, I don't care if I see them anymore. And they just come on Sundays and Wednesdays, and I minister to them. They go home, go, 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 go. And all of a sudden, I found myself growing cold. And in prayer one day, I said, God, I don't understand why I feel this way. Why? These folks are good people. They, they're hurt. They're wounded. Their former pastor committed adultery and left a bunch of bills in town, and the bill was about to fall down around us. Oh, y'all think we had it bad here? Oh, my God, have mercy. I said, God, I, I don't know. And I heard the voice of the Lord impressing me. He said, you're getting what you asked for. I said, God, I don't understand. What do you mean getting what I asked for? He said, you didn't want to have nothing to do with them, remember? You wanted to preach to them. You wanted to bury them when they died. You wanted to marry their kids when they got married. But other than that, you didn't, you didn't want to be around them. You didn't want to social. You didn't want to intermix with them. The prophet of God, he made this statement, and I'm not, I don't remember if it was Isaiah or Jeremiah. One of them made this statement. God told him, he said, I want you to go and I want you to sit among the people. I read that scripture and I, and I said, God, what are you talking about? He said, just what I said, go sit among the people. And Sister Carol, in that moment, I said, God, I'm trying to protect myself. Somebody hear me now. Now, there, folks, there's a reason I work till 11 o'clock getting this message put together, and I'm not preaching it. I built these walls around me because I didn't want to be hurt no more. That's okay, but in doing so, I became totally ineffective as a pastor. And I said, God, I, I, I don't. He said, sit among the people. All this week we prayed every morning at 10 o'clock during a revival. And we'd gather. Some of us would gather. We had a good crowd some days. Some days just two or three of us. But whoever came, we prayed. Others were praying on, uh, at their home that couldn't come. And, and every day I just felt such a sweet presence of God. And Bruce, Bruce was one. He'd come up on the platform. He'd go back there in that back there in that wall and I thought that's a good place for Bruce because he ought to be standing in the corner somewhere. I believe those teachers had him in the corner a lot 
when he was a kid. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I said, he's used to that. I'll let him pray up there. And I thought, well, I'm going to move up on the front. And somebody else was up on the front. So we just moved around, and I sat in different areas in the, uh, the sanctuary on this side mainly. And then, and then the scripture began to speak to my heart again. He said, this is where the people are. This is where the people sit. And what he was saying, he said, prophet of God. And I'm not saying that, but I'm talking about the prophet in, in the Bible. He said, I want you to understand where the people are coming from. He was basically saying, I want you to walk a mile in their shoes. And so when I look back over my life and I see things that have happened to my wife and myself and our family, God used that. As I've been teaching you in the book of James, chapter number 1, God teaches us and helps us and develops us, not just in the good times, but also in the bad times, more so in the bad times. And so God helped me to realize God helped me to realize that everything that I had gone through in my life was to prepare me to come to Lake Hamilton. I said this to you before. I'm not, I'm not trying to brag. I'm not irreplaceable. I know that. Please don't, don't be. But this is our time together. If God tears his coming, every one of us is going to step off the scene and somebody else is going to be secretary, somebody else is going to be pastor, somebody else is going to be deacons. And I said, Father, we want to pass on a legacy that honors our Savior. Amen. You see what I'm saying? And whatever it is that I've gone through, I want you to be able to understand that God brought us here so that I could share from my heart what God has put in me through the things that I've gone through. And I got news for you, church. That don't just work for the pastor. Some of you right now are standing in a place you don't know why you're there and you don't like being there because it ain't very comfortable. And I don't blame you. Anybody that rejoices when tribulation and troubles and trials come their way, I think we need to lock them in a rubber room somewhere and say, God... Have mercy on them. You know what I'm saying? I'm just telling you. I, I'm just telling you. He didn't say rejoice about the tribulation. He said rejoice in the tribulation. And the reason that we do that is because we know because as we give that thing to God and as we surrender our life to God, all of that stuff's going to come to pass and God's going to lead us through it. And when he leads us through it, we're going to be stronger in the faith. And because we're stronger in the faith, we're going to be able to minister to somebody else that finds themselves where we were. And we're going to be able to testify as to how God has brought us through and brought us us out in that situation and ministered to us in such a powerful way, changed our life so that we can help God change somebody else's life. Amen. You see what I'm saying? It, it, we, we're not trying to build a church here where the pastor does everything. I don't believe in micromanaging. Sister Jeannie knows. Sister Jeannie come to me. I love Sister Jeannie. I love, I love Brother Allen. I love her husband. Don't misunderstand me here. Uh, but Sister Jeannie would come to me and she'd say, well, finances, we got, we got this, this, and this. And she said, I think I, I, I think I need to do this or thus or the other. I don't know. I said, Sister Jeannie, I said, you're looking at it every day. I'm, I, you, I trust you. I said, whatever you think you need to do, and, and it always has to do with spending money. Isn't, that, isn't it ironic when the secretary comes to you, it's always about money. It's, all, it's always about money. And I said, well, Sister Jeannie, I said, I trust you. I said, we, we're doing fine. I said, God is, is moving. I, I just ask her once more, how's, how's, how's the finance? I, I, it just blows my mind. And we just keep chipping away, keep moving away, keep going at it, and keep doing what we do. I asked her during this revival. She said, I, I said, I said, can you let me know about the finance? She said, Pastor, they're doing great. Two different times she come in. Can I tell y'all, ladies and gentlemen, that during this revival, can I tell them, Sister Jeannie, is that all? 
it was almost $3,000 came into this church for that revival. I, I, called, I called Bruce last night to see how he was feeling. And he, he said, please tell your people I, I, I appreciate their kindness to us and their, and their welcoming us and their openness to us. And the offering, Brother Pack, was extraordinary for the number of people that we had there in the, in the congregation. Night after night, he said it was extraordinary. I said, I got some extraordinary people. And then he said, there you go, there you go. Every time I talk to him, I'm bragging on y'all. And he told me here a while back, he said, I wish you'd quit talking to me about that church and how wonderful it is. I said, Bruce, I can't help it because you're wandering around in the desert and God brought me to the promised land. Yeah, yeah. He, he, he said, uh, he, he called me the other day, he said, are you still camping? I said, you act like you're jealous. I said, no. I said, we come in, but we got another camp. I said, man, I ain't going to live around all these campsites and not go camping. If you call me, I'll get you called there just as well as I can sitting over there watching Bonanza or in there in my office. I can take my computer with me. I can do my work. Are y'all getting what I'm saying? And so he, he's jealous. That's what it is. He's jealous. You say, Pastor, what are, what are you getting at? When God comes down among us, doesn't need just to be a time of revival. You say, what are you, what are you saying to us, Pastor? Let me just say this, and I'll wrap it up because it's almost time to go. Let me just say this. I want to encourage you. Would, you. would you let me encourage you? Uh, to whatever's going on in your life right now, whatever it is that's got you oppressed, whatever it is, would you please, would you please offer that to God on the altar of prayer? Would you, would you yield? Would you just surrender yourselves? Because see, ladies and gentlemen, that's what we have our problem at. But if we want to have what we've had for months, then we're going to have to do certain things. We're going to have to pray, and we're going to have to believe, and we're going to have to let God work on us. So that we can bless those that come in. Verses 1 through 5. Let me just take, I'll just give you my outline and I'll close. He said, first of all, we've got to realize the presence that brings revival. The second thing we've got to realize, I don't know what mountains are in your life, but they melt in his presence. You don't have anything in your life, anything, hear me, anything in your life that God don't have an answer for. And when you stand in his presence, it just melts away. And again, I think we don't want to get there because we're afraid. The second thing is we've got to realize the problems that prevents revival. Verses 6 through 8. And I'll just tell you this, our sins are separated between us and God. Our self-righteousness is almost like a leper. You know, you've seen pictures of lepers. It's got these rags on, and, and what they do is they get more rags, and they wrap more rags on top of dirty rags, and they just keep wrapping themselves. They'll take those dirty rags off, and then they'll put some more rags that they think they clean, but they wipe them, wrap them around, and they just recontaminate themselves all the time. There's no righteousness in that. You see what I'm saying? As long as we think we're all right, we're never, we're, we're preventing God from doing what he wants to in our life. And the third thing is this, we've got to recommit to the prayer that precedes revival. We've got to pray. And we've got to recognize that God is sovereign, that he's the potter and we're the clay. That it's his church and not my church, not your church. It's God's church. He's sovereign. He's king. He's Lord. He's master. And when he speaks, he said, I want you to move. We've got to also in our prayer remember God's mercy. Because if we don't remember the mercy of God, next thing you know, we're judging one another. And we're sitting over there pointing a finger. I wish so-and-so so get their self right. 
Well, if that's you, if I'm talking to you, then you need to get yourself right. And the last thing about our prayer life needs to be this. Number one, we're going to remember that God's sovereign. Number two, we're going to remember his mercy, and then we've got to respect his glory. When God wants to move, you've got to let him move. God help us. God forgive us. Am I making any sense to anybody? Respect the glory of God. Somebody told me during this revival, said, I've noticed something about you. I said, you're not jealous of your pulpit. I said, no. I said, but why did you say that? He said, well, Brother Doug, he got carried away the other day. I said, yeah, I know. And that don't bother you? I said, no. I said, Brother Doug goes up there, and I trust him enough to lead this service. See, the only reason my brother's coming next week and the only reason I'm going to be gone is because Brother Doug is trusted here. See what I'm saying? And so I just, I talked to Ryan. I said, are you coming? He said, yeah, I'm going to come see Dad and I'll stay with Dad. And Dad, feed him good. Will you do that while he's here? Just feed him good. Somebody said, I've seen pastors get upset when people get excited and start preaching while, while they're, leading service. I said, I don't. I said, my feeling is, well, Brother Doug starts preaching. He's given what God wants to be had, and I just, I'll come back and bring mine next time. I said, he wouldn't be here if I didn't trust him. And the reason I said that to him is I don't want you to think that I just allow anything and everything to come on the platform, stand in the pulpit, and say what they want to say, and do what they want to do. I'm not all, I'm, I'm very protective of this place. And I'm protective because of you, ladies and gentlemen. So yes, if Brother Doug gets up here and he gets excited and he goes to kicking and bucking, he'll either get done in a minute or we're going to kick and buck with him. Somebody say amen right there. I know, he's, I know he's a seasoned minister, but I tell you, I was so proud yesterday. I was so proud. He he just he done an outstanding job. I could take pointers, Brother Doug. He got his message across, and when he got done, he shut up and we went home. It's almost like he said, We're through singing now. <laughs> this is the end of the service. I'm thinking, Sister Dorothy, please for that. Amen. You get what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen. I love you. I thank God for you. I trust you in your ministry roles. And I can't wait to see what God does with us. Stand to your feet all over this place.